And then there's a response, the other section sings, Finding on the Lord's side, whose side are you finding on? Finding on the Lord's side, whose side are you finding on? I'm finding on the Lord's side, and oh man, and then they change it around a bit. Whose side are you praying on? Praying on the Lord's side, and, and it's, oh, it's a good little chorus, I say. And I said, I'm going to use that chorus title as my message title tonight. Whose side are you fighting on? I think you're going to learn something tonight from the text. Because if I'm not mistaken, I may have used this text in the last three and a half years here in Dallas to preach from. But I know this message is not going to be anything like what you might have heard the last time around. Because God gave me a new angle on it. Isn't it interesting how the Lord can do that? Just give you new. 1 Samuel chapter 17, beginning at verse 1, the Old Testament book, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1st and 2nd, Kings, 1st second, and 2nd, Samuel. So 1 Samuel chapter 17, beginning at verse 1, very familiar story. I don't care what kind of church background you come from. Yes, even if you're Jewish, this is something that you grew up reading and hearing, learning about. 17, beginning at verse 1, standing in honor of the reading of God's word, and the word of the Lord reads, the King James tonight says, Now the Philistines gathered together their armies to battle, and were gathered together at Skoko, which belongeth to Judah, and pitched between Skoko and Ithaca, in Ephdamim. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together and pitched by the valley of Elah and set the battle in array against the Philistines. In other words, Saul and his men were having a good old time really pitching a fit against the Philistines. They were giving them a good fight. And the Philistines stood on a mountain on the one side and Israel stood on a mountain on the other side and there was a valley between them, and there went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. And he had a helmet of brass upon his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of brass. And he had greaves of brass upon his legs, and the target of brass between his shoulders. And the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron. And one bearing a shield went before him. And he stood and cried unto the armies of Israel, and said unto them, Why are ye come out to set your battle in array? And I am not I a Philistine, and ye servants to Saul? Choose you a man for you, and let him come down to me. If he be able to fight with me and to kill me, then will we be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then shall ye be our servants and serve us. And the Philistines said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. When, Paul, when Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistines, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Master, we thank you, God, for your word. Lord, as I strive to bring this message out tonight, Lord, I implore you by all that is holy, allow your anointing to rest upon me tonight. Help me, God, to deliver this word that you placed in my spirit. Let it be an encouragement and a help. Lord, let it be strength to our bones this hour, God, in our spiritual being. Help it, God, today to encourage us to keep on pressing on, because indeed tonight we have the victory in Jesus' name. Master, we ask all this in the wonderful, lovely name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Praise God and amen. You may be seated tonight. I'm going to try and keep this message somewhat abbreviated, partly because I about feel like I want to fall over and go to sleep. Secondly, because we want to take Mom out for Mother's Day and have a meal. And uh, 
So I'm going to kind of get right into the meat of this message. We've all heard the story of David and Goliath. We were all weaned on this story growing up as kids. And of course there's a great lesson in the story of David and Goliath and in uh, God being on the side of the right guy. And when God's on your side, you cannot possibly lose the battle. Amen. But you know, it's funny because I've got news for you. There are lots of people every day who have God on their side, but they're still losing the battle. Amen. If you look at the story as I just read it to you a moment ago from 1 Samuel 17 verses 1 through 11, you see that in reality, at first we're told that Saul and his armies were at full array against the armies of the Philistines. They were just having the time of their lives fighting a battle against the Philistines, and they were engaged fully in the battle. But all of a sudden, while the two armies were taking a bit of a respite, one from fighting the other, they each retreated to a mountain on either side of a valley. And while the two armies were catching their breath and getting ready to go back into the next melee, all of a sudden, a figure appeared on the scene that had not been there before. And it was an extremely formidable and scary figure. And that figure, we know, his name was Goliath. And he was a giant of a man, a big man, an exceedingly large man. This is, was not an above average. This was an extremely beyond average in his height. We know that Saul, the Bible says, was head and shoulders above all the men of Israel. So Saul himself was no small man. And he was the king of Israel. And Saul was no midget. He was no small man. And yet when Goliath appeared on the scene, the Bible said, when Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. So even this handsome, strapping, tall Saul was afraid of that Philistine. I want you to know tonight, children, whose side are you fighting on? The enemy's first line of defense against the people of God is distraction. Amen. Do you hear me? That's the enemy's first line of defense against God's church. It is distraction. Goliath was hardly a formidable foe against the armies of Israel. But fear in response to the giant's appearance allowed the Philistines to distract Israel from one-on-one, -on -one, hand to hand combat and instead caused them to focus all their attention on Goliath. They had just been fighting the Philistines yesterday. Why all of a sudden had everything changed today? Why didn't somebody just sound the horn and say, if we all rush in, and if we all carry our spears, and if we all yield our, uh, wield our swords, we can take that giant down, and glory to God, we can win this battle. But no, that it will distract you if he can. And he'll get you to focus on something you don't need to be focusing on so that he can get you around the backside later. I'm telling you, you talk about a prophetic message. The devil is whipping the fire out of God's church tonight because he's got the church focusing on enemies that are not enemies. There is not a person on this planet that is an enemy of God's church. My Lord, have mercy. Let me rephrase that. There are some people on this planet that are the enemies of God's church. But interestingly enough, Instead of seeing those Philistines for the Philistines they are, right. we're letting them tell us how we ought to be fighting the battle. Right. Well, what we need to do, bless God, we need to get out there with picket signs in front of the abortion clinic. Right. We need to let people know that we're standing up for life. Glory to God. Hallelujah. What we need to do is go to the polls and make sure people know that they've got to exercise 
their right as a citizen, and we've got to be uh, militant about the way we approach our right to vote. And I'm watching TV preachers on television, and Rob Parsley today has a big poster up behind the pulpit of himself with a picture of the Capitol in Washington, D.C., superimposed in the background. Because according to Rob Parsley, he's trying to motivate God's people, bless God, to get up and get in there and do what you got to do to take Washington back and make this country the kind of country God wants it to be. And I've got news for you, Mr. Parsley. The whole time you're looking at the gay community and you're seeing a giant and you're seeing an enemy. And every time you look at the abortion doctor and you see an enemy and you see a giant, the real enemy is stepping up behind you, preparing to fight your throat. Amen. Because the first line of defense is, the enemy's first line of defense is distraction. Have you looking over here when you need to be looking over here? Lord, have mercy. I want you to know the enemy can cause God's people to be so in fear of those whom they need fear that we find ourselves fighting beside the enemy rather than against him. That's right. Yep, Woo! That's right. The Roman Catholic Church, if God's word is true, and I believe it is, if the prophecy of John is true, and I believe it is, if the great horde described in the book of Revelation is old mother Rome, and if the false prophet is indeed the papacy, then, honey, I've got news for you. You do not need to be taking your lessons in warfare from them. Hello now. They're the enemy, Paul. They're the one you're supposed to be watching. They're the ones you're supposed to know that you're not to be involved with. Why are you taking lessons in how to fight from them? The Protestant churches have been doing it for the last 25 years. Rome's got everybody so focused on other common enemies. You know, the gay community, because you know the gay community, after all, is just going to destroy the moral fabric and fiber of this country. And you know that they're just out to... And do you see how they villainize people? You see how they paint them in the most evil, ungodly colors that they can possibly mix? Why does Rome do this? Why, when Rome has 80% of its own priests, are queers for God's sake? And yet they claim to take such a hard stand on homosexuality. Why? Because they need that giant. They need that enemy to distract God's people so that rather than looking at the great whore, you're looking at the giant. Lord have mercy. I want you to know when the timing's right, the enemy's going to turn around and slit the throat of God's church. Because while you may be marching alongside of her tonight, baby, she's still your enemy. She may act like your friend, but she is still your enemy. You know, a lot of the countries that Hitler took over during World War II were countries that he had befriended initially. Amen. Mussolini was supposed to be a friend of Hitler's. Hello now. Stalin was supposed to be a friend of Hitler's in the beginning, but all of a sudden, Once he got you close enough, and once he got you comfortable enough, and once he had you focused on a giant enemy called the Jews. Ho, 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 ho! Oh, but see, Rod Parsley, you're too ignorant, you piece of mud, to be able to see that the same demonization and the same villainization that went on during the Holocaust of Jewish people is the same demonization and the same villainization that is happening to, in this country to people who don't deserve that kind of treatment. Amen. That's all right, Mr. Parsley. You just keep preaching your crap. 
you go ahead, keep preaching it, you fool. And you just keep fighting alongside of old Mother Rome. And you never preach, I've never heard one message come off that man's lips about the great horror of Babylon. And my Bible said when she comes out of perdition, in other words, when all her colors finally are seen in the light, and everybody sees what she really is, the Bible says the whole world is going to be amazed, except for this little group of people. It's a little group of people that the Bible said whose names were lit written in the Lamb's book of life from the foundation of the earth. Oh, preacher, if you were saved, if you knew God, if your name was in the Lamb's book of life, you would know tonight who she is. And it started coming against this one and that one. You'd be standing in opposition to her. Lord Jesus, have mercy. What you know the Bible said tonight, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary is the devil, as a roaring lion walketh about, seeking whom he may devour, because his second line of defense is intimidation. First, he likes to distract. Secondly, he likes to intimidate. You've heard me mention it before. I've said it many times, and I'll keep repeating it. And I hope you get it down in your spirit and you never forget it. There's not a lion in God's great creation that hunts and roars while he hunts. Amen. There is not a lion in all of God's creation that roars when he is hunting. He does not or she does not. They do not want to stir their prey away. They want to catch it off guard. They look for the weak. They look for the sickly. They look for the infirm. They look for the one that doesn't look like they'll be able to get away too quickly. And then with great stealth, and then with great speed, and then with great quiet, they will come upon that poor sickly, lagging behind beast and devour it. I want you to know that's how weak our enemy is tonight. I want you to know that's how our wonderful devil who loves to brag about how much he can do and yet he can't take a one of us that's healthy and well and full of the Holy Ghost and standing on Jesus' name. He can't get to us. But oh God, let somebody start going out of church because for one little reason or another little reason and he'll get them real quick like yeah devil you're a hot shot aren't you all your meals are sick amen how'd you like to think mother that every cow you ate had some disease or another that made it where it couldn't walk fast enough to get away from the guy that butchered it. How'd you like to know that every chicken you ever ate had to have a condition or a sickness or a deformity or some sort of an ailment so that it couldn't get away from the butcher in time? But you see, that's the diet the devil feeds on. Amen. That's the diet he feeds on. He can't get God's top dogs, and he knows that. He can't get God's top people, and he knows that. He knows he hadn't got a foot in the world or a hope in hell of touching one of God's faithful. So what he does is he waits for those who begin to slack off and goof off and play games, and honey, he'll pounce on that one until they're dead. Enjoy, devil. I bet there's not a night nice thing them go to bed with a without having gas. All that bad meat, it's got to be good for something. Amen. If you're eating all that diseased and afflicted meat, honey, I'm telling you what, he got to be belching his brains out while he's laying in that bed. It's not a very good diet, I don't think. And then he has the nerve to act like a hot shot and run through the forest roaring trying to intimidate God's people, 
trying to make them afraid. Let me tell you something tonight, children. The enemy wants for us to fight him on his terms. Goliath stepped out with a challenge. Israel could have ignored his challenge and simply begun to throw their spears and charge. That's what they should have done. But instead, they allowed the enemy's distraction to paralyze them and divert their attention from the fact that on one level, no one Israelite could defeat Goliath. An army against army. It's altogether possible that Israel could have defeated the Philistines, including Goliath. Amen. God's church should never be taking lessons in warfare from the enemy. Amen. You hear me now? Goliath come out and said, listen to this, we read it tonight in our text, and there went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistines, named Goliath of Gath, and it gets his measurements and his weight and yada, yada, yada. Verse 8, And he stood and cried unto the armies of Israel and said unto them, Why are ye come out to set your battle in array? And not I a Philistine and ye servants to Saul? Choose you a man for you and let him come down to me. Devil, who do you think you are telling me how we're going to fight this battle? Who do you think you are telling me? Oh, Mother Rome gets on television and tries to poison the minds of God's people and say, Oh, yes, there are false prophets and naysayers out there who will tell you that unity between the Protestants and the Catholics isn't a good thing. And oh, yes, these false prophets, I've heard of them all years in the last week. Right. And I sit there and I say, Devil, who are you to set the rules for battle? Who do you think you are, you crooked little? Who do you think you are to try to tell us how we're going to fight this thing? I got news for you. You don't set the rules. We're God's people. My Jesus said he's given us authority and power to tread upon serpents and upon every deadly thing, from diseases and sickness. Devil, I've got news for you, honey. If anybody's going to set the rules for play, it's going to be me. Right. But the devil's trying to get us to play by his rules. He'll try eventually. He's going to have Protestant preachers speaking against Protestant preachers and saying that they're wrong. They're not doing right. They don't have the right spirit. They're operating in the wrong attitude and the wrong spirit to be saying the things that they're saying about wrong. The devil don't play fair. He didn't play fair when they crucified Jesus. They took what he said, twisted it all out of context, and made it sound like he was saying one thing when he had said something completely different. So I got news for you. It's nothing new. He wants us to play by his rules. But no, I've got news for you. Uh -uh. God's church doesn't take lessons in warfare from the enemy. He does not set the rules for combat. Devil, you do not set the rules for combat. When we finally realize that many of God's rules for combat are not only hard to follow, I've got news for you. Some of God's rules for combat are tough. Some of them are contrary to our very nature as human beings. It just goes against all that's in us. But if we'll fight who God wants us to fight and how the Lord wants us to fight them, maybe when the sun goes down, you'll be assured nothing less than victory. So, Brother Marl, what do you mean by some of God's rules for combat are difficult to follow? Have you ever read Mark chapter 5? This is, uh, no, I'm sorry, let me, Proverbs 15 and 1. A soft answer turneth away wrath, but grievous words stir up anger. But when you're in the heat of battle, <laughs> come on now, you know it can be tough 
to find soft words to say, to turn everything down and turn the fire down instead of heating it up and making it worse. But that's how God says we ought to fight this thing. Matthew 5.25, the Word of God says, Agree with thine adversary quickly, whilst thou art in the way with him. Lest at any time the adversary deliver thee to the judge, and the judge deliver thee to the officer, and thou be cast into prison. You see, it's like this. The Lord says, you got a dispute with somebody? You got a disagreement with somebody? They're in a position to take you to court and let a judge decide. He said, what you need to do is let them have that one. That's what he said. He said, let them have that one. You know why? He said, because I'll tell you why. Because now you got to remember in biblical times, a person could go to jail for debt. Okay, so it's slightly a different, a different application. But the Lord said, you don't want that man to take you to court and have the judge turn around and decide against you and all of a sudden you're in jail all because you were going to stand there and argue with the guy over the debt. So no, instead of arguing with him, just say, okay, listen, I owe you, you're right, I'll pay you as soon as I'm able. You see what I'm saying? That's what the Lord was saying. He said, don't, you know what? We got a bunch of fools, stupid preachers that are running to the courthouse every chance they get to fight for one cause or another. We've got a state Supreme Court fella in Alabama, Arkansas, wherever he's from, he's a hick no matter how you slice it, decides he's going to put a 2,000 ton Ten Commandments statue in the middle of the courthouse. But children, I've got news for you. A courthouse is a civic building. The way I understand it, when a community decides to build a courthouse, they choose what kind of decorations and what kind of adornments and what kind of accoutrements they want it to have. If they want to have the Ten Commandments carved over every single doorway, if they want it to say, Men's room, thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not, ladies' room, thou shalt not, thou shalt not, that's their privilege. And from what I understand, that building has the Ten Commandments in several locations as part of its structure and part of its adornment. Most buildings that are dedicated to the concept of law and justice do have the Ten Commandments somewhere. But he decided he wanted a statue that was specifically dedicated to the Ten Commandments in the middle of the rotunda at the center of the building. He had no more right to do that than if he wanted a solid gold globe placed there. That's not his job. It is a civic building. That is a building that is owned by the people of that county or the people of that state. It's not his job to decorate it any way he wants to decorate it. In the meanwhile, the man winds up going to jail because he won't remove this thing. And there are churches, oh, bless God, I'm going to have Judge so-and-so come speak for me because he is a, a champion of the faith. No, he isn't. He's a jackass. Amen. I get tired of people thinking that people who do stupid things and they're persecuted for stupidity and suddenly they become heroes of the faith. Oh, he's right up there with Martin Luther. No, he's right up there with Deputy Dog. <laughs> oh, dear me. Oh, dear God. I just knew I shouldn't have done that. <laughs> Folks, we got to get our heads on straight. We got to start thinking like we're the army of the Lord. We got to figure out whose side we're fighting on. Are we going to be on the side of Israel or are we going to be on the side of the Philistines? Whose side are we fighting on? And I want you to know tonight, I told you, God, the, the enemy wants to distract us, then he wants to intimidate us.
then he thinks he's going to set the rules of battle. <laughs> Let me give you an example of that, if I may. Mark 5, 1 through 7, and they came over onto the other side of the sea and into the country of the Gadarenes. And when he, Jesus, was come out of the ship, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit who had his dwelling among the tombs. And no man could bind him up, no, not with chains, because that he had been often bound with fetters and chains, and the chains had been plucked asunder by him, and the fetters broken in pieces, neither could any man tame him. And always, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying and cutting himself with stones. But when he saw Jesus afar off, whew, he ran and worshipped him. <laughs> the demons saw God on the horizon. And they cried out with a loud voice and said, What am I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of the Most High God? I adjure thee by God that thou torment me not. Devil. How dare you tell me how to fight this battle? Amen. Do you see how immediately they thought they were going to set the rules? Do you see how immediately they, he, they no more had given him the glory that was due him than the next words off of the lips of that man were words trying to tell Jesus, Oh, don't torment us. Oh, don't turn us out of here. Oh, don't throw us out of this home that we've made our own. You hear what I'm saying today? You come up against the demon. I'm going to tell you, you get, you get to cast the demons out. I've done it enough times, sweetheart. I got it down. Amen. And you know, I'm these ignoramuses that are so hooked on Benny Hinn haven't got enough, haven't got enough discernment in their spirit to blow their nose. You go to cast the demon out of a person, first thing going to happen, that person going to fall over like they've been slain in the spirit. Why? Because the enemy's first line of defense is distraction. Make him think something's happened when it hasn't. The devil knows all he got to do is make the preacher think something's happened to leave him alone, and he's fine. They know that. All I got to do is make that stupid preacher think something happened. Well, this preacher ain't that stupid. Had a lady at First United Pentecostal Church in Staten Island, New York. Went up to the pastor said, Pastor, you got a lady in your church demon possessed. She's asked me to help her. Do you mind? He said, No, sir, by all means. I began to rebuke the spirit. When I did, immediately she went straight down the floor. I reached down, took her by the wrist, and said, You get up in Jesus' name. And she boxed up on her feet like there was a spring in her back. Three times that happened. And each time, I, I, I missed the phrase there, I said, I rebuke you, you little spirit of distraction. In the name of Jesus, get up on your feet. Because I knew what was happening. I know what the enemy's first line of defense is. I knew he was trying to distract, and I was not going to let him get away with it. That lady was delivered, honey. I'm going to tell you. That if that lady was delivered, her house was delivered, that woman wound up going to a doctor and finding out that she had an ailment that she had had in her body for at least three years. And she told me she had been in agonizing pain for three years. She said, that more, every time I go to the doctor, they tell me they can't find anything. I said, it's because of the demonic presence you've had in your life and in your body. They have been camouflaging it. This way it makes you look like a nut. Because the doctors are looking at things, we don't see anything. And you're in agony, and you know you've got a real ailment. Then I cast the demons out of her, and I said, call your doctor, go see your doctor. He, they're going to find out what your problem is now. She comes back and says, no, no, you're right. You're right, I've got a pelvic infection. The doctor said it's so bad that I must have had it for years. But she never saw it before. But of course you didn't, honey, because the devil's there to torment you. That's what his whole job is, to cause you pain and discomfort. So that, he's trying to wean away at your faith. He's trying to wear away at your faith in God by causing you all this discomfort. And a, look at what he did to Job. He made him miserable. He made him uncomfortable. He figured somewhere along the line, Job will deny me. I said, that's what the devil's trying to do to you. Somewhere along the line, this woman will give up on God. I said, but honey, you didn't give up on God, not till you got your deliverance. <laughs> but see, if you 
If you're not careful, the devil thinks he'll call the shots and tell you what you can do and what you can't do. He'll, he thinks that he can tell you the rules for engagement. And I'm here to tell you tonight, the devil hasn't got the authority to set the rules for engagement. I want you to know tonight that we can only prevail in this battle when we realize that the battle is not ours, but the Lord's. See, Goliath got out there and he, he gave his challenge to the people of Israel. And he said in, in verse 8, he, and, it, and he stood and cried unto the armies of Israel and said unto them, Why are ye come out to set your battle in array? Am not I a Philistine, and ye servants to Saul? Wrong, devil. Wrong, devil. <laughs> see, Roman Catholic people may see themselves as servants to John Paul or Pope Benedict or whomever. But i got news for you. I'm a servant to nobody but Jesus Christ Almighty. And I've got news for you, devil. When you look at me and you look at me and you say, well, aren't you a servant of George Bush? No, baby. I'm a servant of God. When you look at me and say, well, aren't you a servant of the governor of this state, no, sir. I'm a servant of the Most High and living God. When you look at me and say, well, aren't you the servant of your daddy or your mama? No, sir, I am not. I'm a servant of the Most High God. I don't answer to daddy and mama. I'm not serving daddy and mama. I'm serving the Lord. And if you don't like that, that's tough. See, the devil loves to try to point you in the direction where you're going to feel an obligation to somebody other than God. And you're going to feel that someone other than God has an obligation to you. Well, aren't you all servants of Saul? The, the Philistines wanted the Jews to forget about the God they served and think about the king they served. I'm going to tell you, the devil will do it to you every time. The devil will come against your mind and he'll remind you, oh, but what about mommy and daddy? What about what they say? Oh, but what about this one? What about what they say? What about that one? What about what they say? i got news for you, devil. I could care less. Jesus said, if you love father and mother more than me, you're not worthy of me. So you know what? I really don't care, devil, what mommy or daddy says. I'm telling you, I'm a servant of God. The mistake Goliath made was he thought that the Jews were the servants of Saul. He forgot and he or he did not realize that there was a covenant made between God and those people and they were the servants of God and not the servants of Saul. I want you to know tonight in closing, right now, when little David came along with supplies for his brothers, he wasn't able to wear Saul's armor. Nor was he able to bear up under Saul's spear or his shield. But you know, there's an old song that says, Take the name of Jesus with you. Because in the end, Second Chronicles 20, 14 through 15, Then upon Jehe Jehaziel, the son of Zechariah, the son of Benaiah, the son of Jeho, the son of Mattaniah, a Levite of the sons of Asaph, came the Spirit of the Lord in the midst of the congregation. The Spirit of the Lord came upon this man, Jehaziel. And he said, Hearken ye all Judah, and ye inhabitants of Jerusalem, and thou King Jehoshaphat. See, sometimes Saul needs to listen too. Sometimes the king needs to listen too. Sometimes the president needs to listen too. Thus saith the Lord unto you, Be not afraid nor dismayed by reason of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours, but God's. Hallelujah! The only way we're ever going to win in spiritual warfare is when we realize the battle isn't ours, but God's. David came out finally with all, without the accoutrements of battle that Saul had and the other soldiers in the Israeli army had 
All he had was what he carried as a little shepherd boy. But he had something else that not one man in that army had in his mind. And that was he knew who his God was. And he came out to old uh, uh, Goliath and he said, You come out to me with swords and shields and spear in hand. He said, But I come to you in the name of the Lord. <laughs> Woo! Glory! Little David, that little boy, he was up there watching his brothers quake in fear and watching Saul be afraid. And he said, Who is that uncircumcised Philistine to come and to declare himself against the armies of the living God? See, David knew who they were. David knew who they were. And that's why David was the one God could use to go down there and kill Goliath. Because it wasn't about, see, we get so caught up in the idea, fight fire with fire. Well, I got to do it the way they do it. They're nasty, I got to be nasty back. They're evil, I got to be evil back. I got news for you. I know that the Roman Catholic organization is the most evil, demonic organization on the face of planet Earth. But that does not mean for one second that I have to be evil or mean to a Roman Catholic person. That does not mean for one second that I have to treat Roman Catholic people as being evil and mean. Do you understand what I'm saying? I know that the doctrine of certain organizations is as foul and as stenchful as anything I've ever seen in my life. But Tommy can tell you, I can sit down and eat with these people and treat them as human beings and be perfectly nice to them and decent. Am I right? Because that's the way of the cross. I'm not going to play by the devil's rules. I'm going to play by God's rules. I'll tell you what, I'll love you into this thing if I can help it. Amen. I'll show you so darn much love that you'll want to be saved. Amen. I love you so much you're going to want to know the truth. Praise God. Amen. Would you stand with me tonight? Tonight, children, the battle is not ours, but God's. Don't let him distract you. Don't let him intimidate you. Do not let him try to tell you how to fight this war. You fight it God's way, and don't worry about anything else. Just fight it God's way. Master, we thank you tonight for this message. We thank you, God, for your word.